This is tuna on toast. I mean, someone that knocks like that, it has to be Stephen Jenkins. Who is it? It's I, Steven. Steven! Hello, Steven! Whoa, he's looking good! Lo and behold. That's How are you? I'm well, thank you. We've crossed paths, but never had a super hangout before. It's time. It's time. <laughs> Steven, do you know what you've got yourself into? Here you go. Here's beautiful coffee for you. His roommate's a hobbyist. <laughs> We're not roommates. <laughs> he thinks you're my roommate. So, my roommate won't quit fucking around under the sink. <laughs> Wish I knew that. <laughs> yeah, roommate, so that was friend. not on Craigslist. <laughs> All right, Stephen. You're in the chair on the left. Oh, I'm wow. going to be right here. Okay. Let me get this, this thing recorded. In the morning. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Tuna on Toast. I am Ted Stryker, so excited to be joined by the front man of a band you know very well. He slash they just released their seventh full-length studio album called Our Band Apart, Stephen Jenkins. What's up, man? Thank Hello. you. Good to see you again, and, and uh, nice to be here in your studio. Yeah, thanks for coming over. It was, um, you know, you were on time, and when people are on their way, I always peek my head out the front door. Because I just want to make sure that they know, hey, it's right here. Yeah. And you you Ubered here. You didn't drive, right? I did not drive. I Ubered. Yeah, man. Because yeah, I, I live in San Francisco, but I'm staying basically down the street. Uh, so, yeah, I, I probably could have walked. But it's raining here in L.A. and what I, I love. Yes. But what I really appreciated about you, Stephen Jenkins, mm. when you walked in... You did your feet like on the towel that I laid out so we wouldn't get footprints all over the place. <laughs> I mean, I just, I think good manners are underrated, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's important. It's important. Manners. So I have, I have some, uh, you know, I have a lot of, I have a lot of nieces and nephews and, and, uh, I have 11 godchildren and, uh, some of them, it's it's the, just manners are, are the the interface system for human interaction. If you don't have them, then you you it just doesn't compute. Right, right, a million percent. I agree with is, that. The code goes wrong. So yeah, wipe your feet. R wipe your feet. On that's the moral of the story. Wipe your feet. Steven. A jam here. That's the song. You're a Bay Area guy. I am, but you're living down the street from me. Yeah, living. Yeah. When are you going back? Do you still have a place there? Is LA your new home? I was watching your documentary and there was, it was only two seconds in the documentary, but you mentioned you like LA now. I love LA now and I never used to. I lived here for three years in the late nineties and uh, early aughts and um, uh, early 2000s. And um, I just always felt on edge. I always felt like I, I just couldn't deal with the, there's a, there's, there's something about Los Angeles that is kind of, um, I don't know the businessy part of it that like everyone, um, kind of gaming for something, uh, made me insecure. And now that's either changed or I don't care. And I don't really know. And I don't really, I don't think it matters the difference, but there's, but I feel an energy here in, in LA that I really enjoy. And this morning in the rain, I went up and, you know, trudged up Runyon Canyon and, and, uh, it just, I feel motivated by it in a way that I haven't in the past. So yeah, wow. I love LA. <laughs> and, um, if you're thinking of moving to Austin, go ahead. Right. It's better for everybody. <laughs> it's good for Austin. It's good for LA. Yeah. The new album, mm. which I've listened to many times, Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can sing the songs. The, uh, the opening track, I absolutely love. Thank Goodbye to the days to of Ladies and Gentlemen. Uh -huh. What a way to start an album. Was that all made in Los Angeles, yes. this album? It was? It was. It was all made at Lucy's Meat Market. Is that uh, in near, Silver Lake or no? It's near Silver Lake. So, yeah, it's all on that side of town. It's uh, in Highland Park. Oh, uh, right. Eagle Rock. Yeah, Eagle Rock, of course. Yeah. 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 Um, you have an eagle here. Seen better days. Yeah. <laughs> it's a vulture. 
Um, we had too many shots of vodka, so we just let just stay here for a little bit. It's a vulture with dreams <laughs> of eagledom. Um, yeah, at, I was in Eagle Rock, and uh, the the band all moved down here, and so I'm the only one who still lives in San Francisco. And I was actually fine that the album was recorded. Our band apart was recorded in the kind of the last days of the lockdown, just right as vaccines were were coming into play. So we were actually, if you look at the the documentary um, called How We Hold Each Other Right Now. Which is a line from a song on the new album, of yeah, course. Song, the song Dust Storm. Yeah, um, Dust Storm. We were actually still rehearsing in masks at that oh, point. We were actually right. sitting in a room together and everybody right. was wearing a mask. Yes. Um, and then as the, as the, uh, as it goes forward, I guess there's, we made the album in about a month. Um, is that a short time for you or is that a long time for you to make an for album? Me, that's a very short time. Um, I, I wrote the album mostly in, uh, up at my house in Bolinas, uh, my beach house. Don't you know, darling? <laughs> <laughs> my be- you spoiled motherfucker. Um, and, uh. And so I, I just sort of worked up these songs and then I came down and several also I, I co-wrote with uh, my keyboard player, Colin, and then kind of workshopped them with the band um, for maybe a, a week or 10 days. And it's just sitting in a room, uh, acoustic guitars, keeping it all very simple, really not trying to explore sounds. And then um, actually in the last two days of that, um, my guitar player, Chris, started playing the riff for Dust Storm. And I was like, what is that? Because he forgets everything immediately. He's like a fish discovering, you know, a sunken castle. Um, he he had this great riff, and I was like, just keep playing it. And three days later, we recorded it, and that's Dust Storm. Wow. So it all kind of came together fairly quickly and came together in, in L.A. and and in that in that process i was just sort of catching some kind of vibe of la and like the song silver lake neophyte the video um, just dropped for that yeah i love the song silver lake neophyte as well which i mean with it doesn't take a genius well maybe it does the first 30 seconds it sounds like you're maybe questioning how you got to this place your success are you the real deal yeah. like is that kind of the theme of that track yeah i think it is and but it's not only questioning myself it's also so it's it's kind of questioning the whole um the whole scene i think i think there was it my songs tend to not be about a thing and um i can't say this song is about it doesn't really work that way um that one, I was sitting in my little Zendo studio. This is me playing an acoustic guitar. This is the international <laughs> sign. And I had been listening to a lot of this neo folk stuff. Um, Adrian Lenker, um, Phoebe Bridgers. Um, and I was, I was like, wow, just, you're really bringing your whole self to this. Um, there's a guy, what's his name? Christian, Nathan Christian. There's a, people whose names I'm sort of leaving out, but I've been listening to a lot of this and it was kind of an LA focused thing. And I thought there's just this, there's this wholeness and this authenticity to, to what I'm hearing here. Uh, and am I, am I bringing my whole self and am I, am I like, or am I kind of, or am I like, or am I gussing it up to tell us to, to make a story, you know? Okay. And then at the same time I was like, yeah, but you know what else? There's also kind of this like, so so I'm catching that 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 energy, that Gen Z energy. But I was like, there's also this kind of like, you know, there's also something kind of. Um, are you getting off on it? Are you are you being? Is this like, I'm I'm so radically, you know, I'm so radically honest that I'm sort of uh, there's a kind of. Um, when you get off on exposing yourself, being an exhibitionist. Okay, right. Exhibitionist. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Is, or is there something sort of exhibitionist about this where the energy is coming from that, right? So I'm like, so I'm like, I'm moved by this. I'm, 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 um, I'm questioning myself on this, but I'm also questioning it. 
and the and in the end i think the resolve and the song the, the value of this song is it doesn't really matter hmm. because we we are all um we don't we don't discover ourselves we invent ourselves we are these we are these how do we invent ourselves by uh being inspired and enthused by what we are seeing around us on the internet and real life. And so we want to match up to those other things. Sure, of course. And then also by our practices and by the amount that we uh, reach or don't reach our aspirations, um, all of those things. Mm. But, um, you know, when you decide that you like Keds and you want to paint your hair green and you, you know, and you're over ska and you only want to listen to, <laughs> you know, punk, that is not a discovery. That is a that is a moving forward. That's an exploration, right? In into um, invention, and so so go ahead and try it on. That's what I'm saying. It's like we don't need to have this kind of judgment for ourselves. The, the real thing is, is like in the end, are you are you coming up with something that is whole to you? And that's really the whole point of my whole that whole album is. I really don't care if it gets played on the radio. I don't care what kind of metrics i certainly don't care if it gets a fucking grammy is I, it an imperfect record meaning that you didn't tinker with it for months and months and months and wake up in the middle of the night like oh i gotta change this 2.2 seconds in this one song you did it you guys got together they're yeah. very honest lyrics yeah. and then you're like f it it's done here you go yes that's cool man yes that's Good kind job. of that's kind of how that went and you know, I went through that with my my manager, Missy Colazzo, um, because I had had a whole other album ready to go before this. What and you it, did? Yeah, so we we had a we had a sold out tour before the pandemic really hit, right? The pandemic, the first the the, the ground zero for the pandemic was Seattle, and yes, Seattle went into lockdown twelfth of March. Our show was on the eleventh of March, and we canceled our show, and. The, we just didn't know. I think it, we almost forget how scared and confused we were at that time. Right. And the NBA, maybe it was that exact date, had canceled a game or two. In the, and one was in, at halftime of a game. They're like, oh, we're done. We're clearing out the arena. Damn. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, anyway. Um, yeah. So it, and we were going to workshop that album on the tour at Soundcheck. So go in and Soundcheck and we just play new songs. And that was the plan and the tour canceled. And then all of those songs to me didn't emotionally resonate at the time. I was like, I like this, these songs just don't apply right now yeah. to how I feel. So why force it? And, and then I didn't do anything for a minute. Um, i I made cocktails on Instagram, I think for a while. And then, and, uh, and then I kind of forced myself to sit down and play. And, um, and that's how that album came together. So it was very much an album um, kind of in the lockdown and dealing with uh, whatever emotional landscapes were coming up at that time. From roughly 2003 to 2019, there was maybe three or four albums that you put out. And that's, for some bands, that is not a lot of music to put out. But then yeah. all of a sudden you go from like 2018, 19, it's like, okay, here's two or three albums plus you made one that you didn't put out. What is the difference between the last three years to the previous however many years that is, 10 to 15 range? Um, it's a rediscovery of my rock and roll mindset. Re okay, what does that mean? That means fuck your opinion. This is what I'm putting out, and I'm no longer going to allow myself to be subject to judgment, including the judgment of myself. How did you get to that point? Is that therapy? Is that g getting a little bit older, or maturing? What is that? Well, I don't know because it's certainly something that that I possessed, and then I think that um, I think probably after out of the vein, um, I had been going for so long, um, and um, our record company uh, disappeared. Electra? Uh, Electra, yeah, just went away um, right when we put that album out. That was 2003, and roughly. Something like that, yeah. And um, and I, I'd gone through like a, like a 
a really like big breakup and I was sure. just, um, I think I was just in some like dazed reassessment and I went and produced some other people's albums. Right. And there was just this kind of like restarting, but there was also, it's quite a thing to put yourself out to the, the critique of others, you know? Um, especially if you're a person who is, um, uh, vulnerable and and um, has a sense of uh, permeability and empathy, which I think artists have to have. Um, that can be that can be a lot to deal with. So I don't know. It just kind of things just kind of close down for a minute, and then I think I did kind of like re in some much better, much more whole way I re-knit myself together um, and figured out that my job was to make something that is whole and true to me and it's not my job to judge it and really, really to stop being in some kind of exchange um, with um, how it's perceived. You see, everything you just said makes a zillion percent sense. And I'm glad that you've come to a place where mentally that you can do all that. But in my bubble, which is a thousand times smaller than yours, like I have been attempting to do that for a long time, but it's so much easier said than done to just do the art, do the perform, whatever it is, put it out there. And it's like, look, I prepared, I did my best. If uh, you random humans are going to scream at me that I look silly on camera and I question, okay, I get, that's, I get, that's what it is, but I'm going to keep going with it. It's hard. There was a, there was a thing that happened to me, um, I went to see a doctor and it was one of these like kind of like optimizing your health, testing all of your blood levels, um, your, you know, uh, micronutrient levels, et cetera. And she said, you have a signature, um, in your blood that is, um, uh, of your liver, um, that is characteristic of early childhood trauma. And, I want you to see an osteopath and I didn't know what an osteopath was. And I'm very adverse to kind of like pointy tin hat shit. It's just, I, I don't, uh, I kind of went dog eared on that. What's an osteopath and why would that? Okay. I'll go see an osteopath, but I don't want you to tell the osteopath what's going on. So, and I so for want, everybody, an osteopath in one clear sentence is yeah. what? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> is it someone that studies? No, I'm not even going to guess what it is because then that's going to be terrible. I still don't totally understand <laughs> what it is. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the doctor says you have, based on what I'm seeing in your team blood. Of, there's 11 people over there all sitting at com computers. Um, just have one of them look it up. Can one of you guys look it up? What are you talking about? Or my I'm, house, there's no one I'm here except Sean Say right there. Um, so they say there is... Based on what I'm seeing in your blood, it, it seems like you maybe went through something, some sort of trauma as a child. Go see an osteopath. Yes. You say, okay, don't tell them what I told you. Then what happens? So I go see this guy, <laughs> um, and his name is Seth Lynn. Okay. And Seth Lynn is in Marin, and he's not touchy-feely at all. He's just kind of a dude. And I lay down on the table, and he's like... He's just kind of doing these like kind of movement alignment of, of bones. And I said, you know, I really, I, I'm just not into chiropractory. I broke my neck surfing and I broke my back. I'm like, I don't want anybody touching my neck. And he goes, yeah, no, that's scary. And then he goes, Ooh, liver's all fucked up. I was like, well, that's interesting. And, uh, and then he started talking and he said, did you have, do you have a, Exactly, right? So he's like, did you have a little, he goes, do you have a brother? Um, he's like, a, you're older than you. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Like, are you Googling? I don't know how. Right, how yeah. He continues talking and he's just kind of talking away and he's talking away. 
And, uh, and, um, he said, yeah, there's just like, there's this little boy, this little six year old boy. And, uh, um, yeah. And then you just kind of walked away from yourself. And, uh, so basically what happened was he took me back to some childhood self through time travel where I guess it was hypnotism, um, reached in with like, there was a back cracking involved in somewhere in there. Um, and re knit me in some profound way. And, um, it, it, it just completely changed my existence. And the thing is, how many there's years a line in a Phoebe Bridgers song okay. yeah. that says, uh, this, it was one of my favorite songs of last year. Um, it's a song, um, someday I'm going to live in a house up on the hill. You know that song? When your skinhead neighbor goes missing. I know the song. I know, I know of her. Then. Well, it's a beautiful song. Yeah. Um, garden song. Okay. And she says, um, the doctor put her hand up on my liver and said, your resentment's um, getting smaller. And I'm like, shit. I could have written that lyric. <laughs> <laughs> that happened to me. <laughs> you know? And so, um, yeah. Anyway. I'm not trying to be, I get but too it was, personal. It, it like did put it into, it, it did like at some point, because you're asking like, how did you restart? Yes. Into, yes. How did you, how did, so it all comes back to this. Basically, um, I energetically fixed my liver and knit myself back together with my six-year-old self. And I got, um, coupled with the idea, with a kind of stoic, it's like some combination of a stoic or Buddhist concept that comparison is the enemy of joy. A million, yes, I, I definitely agree. And I love that line. Yes, when you start comparing yourself, it's going to to other people and what they're doing. All your joy sucked out immediately. Right. Yep. So, as if you look at, if you look at, you know, you know their sneakers, or or somebody else's house, or their amount of streams on their new song, right? Whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> or like you know, or um, um, you know, how many stars did they get on? whatever, it, it doesn't matter what it is. As soon as you do this, as soon as you move into this, into that mindset, it's never going to work out. Right. I have friends who are billionaires who feel poor. Hmm. Because they're looking at their billionaire the friends. Is that why? Some shit. Yeah. I don't know, but it never stops. And I have a friend who is a house painter. He's like the last house painter who lives in San Francisco. And that guy is rich hmm. he's rich he's yeah. got two he's got two healthy little boys he he goes out and catches his own salmon and he can surf like a bastard at ocean beach and he is just like it's just that guy is rich wow. and he is not in the business of comparison unless it's you know to it's hard laugh. not to compare it is freaking hard not to compare it's a real achievement and, is. and um, also, I think a big success, sorry to interrupt, is mm. once you create what you're creating, just putting it out there for the world to look at it and judge it, that should be success as well. And, I, and you know, I, you mentioned um, um, how we hold each other right now. I, I want more people to see it. Um, it hasn't gotten very many streams. That's the documentary. If you go to YouTube, go to YouTube. There's four parts to it. It is... It's not like five hours long or anything. It moves really fast. It's shot really well. And it takes takes you inside to the making of the new album. Mm. And it's really, it's not only well shot, it's well done and it's informative. Um, thank you. I'm I'm like, I'm really proud of it. And, and the way that that came together is that um, Chris, who edited, edited it, um, and he also filmed it, set up cameras and then we just forgot about them so you know when you have a camera on like we have a camera on right now yeah. so so there is a level at which your representative um is standing in front of you um but when you're working with people who you know and love like like our bandmates um eventually you forget that um if the, the camera's just sitting there in a corner and you forget that it's on so you get down to a more 
the real you. And you're also able to catch the moments where we were actually playing the songs. So that documentary is when we're playing, that's what's on the record. And I, I, I think that's, and it's how we're interacting genuinely in that moment. I like also one of you would play a note and someone would say, ah, I'm not really feeling it right there. Or you came in too early singing or you didn't start singing. And I'm supposed to come in right here. Yeah. There's a, that hint of tension mm. is also really nice to see. Cause I think you, not you, one needs that at times to get to the place you want to creatively. Absolutely. You know, the first three police records are just brilliant and they we're at each other's throats. Oh, right. I didn't oh know yeah. That. <laughs> and the first one, you know, Roxanne, which is like like just one of the greatest songs ever written, yeah. is in this shitty little sixteen track studio and they really don't like each other. They also love each other, but like it's not fun. Blondie parallel lines. Yeah. They want they wanted like blood. There was actually like, you know, there there were ass whoopings ready to happen um in parallel lines one of the greatest records ever yeah fleetwood mac rumors oh all yeah the stories of that right it's not fun um but if you look in 2021 they're still kind of uh bickering oh i worked with um stevie nicks and with um uh lindsey buckingham i i got to produce both of them um independently and the first time i met them um I was, I was producing uh, Vanessa Carlton at like right. a hit factory or something like that. You did worked on her second album, right? I worked. Uh, I uh, produced her second and third album. Nice. Um, and um, they were down the hall, and I just kind of walked in <laughs> and said, "Can we borrow you for a second? Could you? Would you come play on this?" <laughs> and this is to Lindsay, right? And so Lindsay comes down there. And Stevie was like, well, it's not going to go out there without me. No. <laughs> yeah, so she walks in, right? And to me, like, this is just, I've gotten to play with a lot of people. I think Stevie Nicks is the greatest musician probably I've ever played with. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And what is and it I'm including about Stan her? Getz. I'm including some, like, pretty, you know, Keith Richards, like, I'm including because she's just weird. Like everything that's weird about about um, Fleetwood Mac, all those all those like funky harmonies and stuff. That's her. It's kind of underrated. She's dope. Anyway, so is he. They're they're great. But they were actually just carrying out. You know, I'm because I learned to play drums as a little kid playing uh, to Fleetwood Mac. Um, so. Um, like I can do that. I can, I can do that. Like I have that rhythm ingrained, um, from, um, Nick Fleetwood. Like, so I really knew their stuff and kind yeah. of knew the story of like how they were all at it and they're still at it. They were at it right there. Right. Yeah. That's cool. It doesn't man. stop. P point being is that it, it can, that tension can actually really help make music right. and I will cultivate that in a studio if everybody gets comfortable, I'll start just going in and going like, why are we waiting? I want a track. I want a track like that. And I don't really feel that way. I'm just thinking that it might help. And it does right for you sometimes. But I think in this, I think in our band apart, the, the overriding thing was this is a group of people who love each other. This is our band and, and the people around it, like that, that are that a small sphere of people who, who, um, are in this, in, in this inner kind of sanctum of third eye blind really love each other. We've been away from each other for a long time and it's just kind of the joy of getting back together and exploring and making something without preconceived notions is something that's, I hope that people can have that feeling. And when you see the documentary, this is just bringing back to this. I think that Chris really captured that in it and I want more people to see it. Um, but comparison is the enemy of joy. We made it. And, um, and 
so I have to, there are times where I have to remind myself to, go, to yeah. be, to take, to just go, yeah, but you made it. And some people did see it and, and some people enjoyed it. So, and there's some people, it's not going. that they didn't want to watch it. They may not know about it. Maybe right now, as you're watching or listening to our podcast right now, when this is done, go watch it. It's real. It's really well done. Thank you. Again, I t- already told you my favorite parts, what I like in it. Um, okay. So many of your songs that you have recorded over the years, there's 12 year olds and 72 year olds that know every line to every song. Does that surprise you? That there's 15 year olds, they're like, Third Eye Blind is my jam in 2020, 2021. It did. It did. It did surprise me. And now I'm I'm grateful to it. Um, and I still don't understand it. Um, but it there been there is there is some um there's something that that we catch on to. I mean, we're we're an indie rock band. We always have been, and we got saddled with some hits. And um, and it's not the first time a band who was an indie rock band or a punk band. I mean, Rancid, they were a punk band, and what happened? They ended up super mainstream, AFI, also from the Bay Area, by the way. A punk band, hard, and look what happened in like 2000. Right, right. I love Rancid, by the way. So and good. I really love Tim Armstrong and Mike. <laughs> yes. Um, Great, what a songwriter. I'm not like a, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not a starstruck kind of person. Um, when I first met uh, Tim Armstrong, I'm like, I'm very happy to be meeting you right now. <laughs> yeah. Do you um, remember where that was? Yeah, it was at um, it was at the K Rock. Oh, the Weenie uh, Roast. Uh, Acoustic Christmas. Acoustic Christmas, the yeah, winter show. A couple of years ago. Yeah. Oh wow. Recently. Yeah, and he was sitting in with a band he produced. Um, the Interrupters. The Interrupters, who, who are I great. also really like. Yes. Because I thought they are like. Their ska, their ska is like that ska that I like. It's like, it's not. I I, I hate that like frat boy shit, ska. Like I never liked that. Like we're a fun party band. Like I always wanted to have some. Um, I there's a niche edge kind of ska that I really loved that I thought they really got a hold of. Oh, nice. Yeah, and uh, and that was uh, that was because of Tim. So. Um, so what happened there was um, uh, I asked um, one of the interrupters um, <laughs> if they wanted to come sing with us. Uh, no. If they wanted to guest with us. And they said something was like, well, Tim Armstrong's guesting with us. I'm like, oh, shit. Well, I want to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> so I came over. I just walked into their dressing room. Yeah. And uh, so. Wow, yeah. man. Okay, so Ed, so you're this indie rock band that has a lot, a lot of hits, very, very catchy songs, and people that are are discovering you. I mean, you can go on YouTube. I think a song that is underrated but still a hit, how's it going to be? I think if a 16-year-old going through something is going to hear that song and see that video and be like, who are these guys? What are their other songs? Mm. Well, there is some, there's some kind of discovery that happens, and I think that that's one of the, the really positive things about Spotify, actually. Um, you know, they get poo pooed a lot um, for taking all the money. Um, there is that, but um, we'll probably play this summer when we tour this summer. We'll we'll probably play bigger audiences this summer than we've ever played, and it just God dang and and that is because of of discovery of the virality of, of sharing stuff and, and people finding it uh, from each other online. So um, growing up, you mentioned a lot of surfing. You played the drums. Mm. Is, was music always the thing you wanted to do being a band? Yeah, it was, but I also liked Jacques Cousteau. So I really liked um, biology and, and I wanted to be a Marine biologist and that my parents oh. could get behind, but um they were, uh, I guess they were divorced by the time I was seven. And, um, so all the kinds of chaos that comes with that. Um, is that why the osteopath person, maybe at seven, there was that trauma, the divorce and all that. And maybe that could be part of that. I think so. Yeah, Hmm. I think so. 
my remedy, my way of holding everything all together and keeping it in uh, an orbit and a rhythm uh, was to play drums. So I would play drums four hours a day. Wow. And I, I don't, I just, I don't know any musicians, really, really good musicians who had totally um, functional, happy childhoods. They don't seem to go together. Um, some players, but, but most most writers, I think, have to be. There has to be some thing that you um, are trying to remedy, or or some uh, question that you're you're trying to answer somehow. Um, so, my means of doing that was drums, and and I became a you know professional musician by the time I was seventeen um, from doing that. So, wow. but at the same time, uh, my parents expected me to, they were kind of intellectuals and that's what they understood and that's what they wanted for me. So, so I went to college. It was at Berkeley. Yeah. That's a hard school to get into. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so you had to have done well in high school to get accepted to that university. I think they made a mistake because <laughs> <laughs> I was just staring out the window. just like everybody else. Yeah. Are you glad you went to college? Your parents are intellectuals. You're a creative guy. You're playing drums. Are you glad you went? Yeah. I had a great time in college. I loved it. And I think um, I dropped out of biology pretty pretty quickly. How come? It's hard. Yeah. Biology's hard. O-chem. Yeah. O-chem, really. <laughs> you you don't want to you don't want to go up with is so, like a lot of immigrant kids coming in there whose parents came here which is like you know um immigrants are the are the absolute energy immigrants are why always why uh what's great about america and it's the, it's the energy of it so my great grandfather came over here from wales uh because he was the poorest kid mm. and he sent his kid to yale like and he was like you know my great great my great grandfather was like a farmhand, um, and then homesteaded a ranch. And it's that kind of energy of like that desperation for something better, and it just continues to happen. And it happens at Berkeley, and those kids, instead of being farmhands, um, are going to be biology majors, and we don't stand a fucking chance. <laughs> so it's like there's no way I'm going to like, you know, these like these like. Indian kids and these Korean kids are just, I'm going to get smoked. And I did. So he came out the other side. Doing and I was just writing okay. lyrics the whole time. So I just went over and became an English lit ma major. And, oh, okay. Yeah. And so you're done with Berkeley. And mm -hmm. I always am very, very interested in every artist I've met throughout my career on the weeks or months leading up to signing like a real record deal. Was it, was there a lot of nerves? Did you know what you were doing? Was there like a, you had to go to an office and play a song in front of people? We were over it by that point. What do you mean you were over it? We had been like, I had been working for so long to, to make it. And this is why, like, like, I don't know what it's like to be, um, an up and coming artist now, like, uh, you know, using SoundCloud and everything. It's, it's, it's a, it's a different landscape but it wasn't better back then when you had to get permission from tommy matola to to rock it just wasn't it wasn't better that there were only if you weren't on k-rock it, it wasn't going to happen for you right these tiny little gatekeepers doesn't make it better and we were um, that started with getting a record deal because you just couldn't afford to go off and make um, albums. You couldn't afford the studio time. The, the, the gear wasn't available. You couldn't go, you know, like Mike Skinner um, made uh, The Streets, um, made one of my favorite records ever. He didn't even have an Apple. He made it on a, a Dell, like just huh. the worst possible computer with the worst possible junk sitting in his room. And made a classic record. You couldn't do that. You had to get a record deal. And you had to get this apparatus behind you. And that apparatus had an ag agenda. And that agenda is quarterly profits. So what what they wanted to do was suck the hit out of you 
and spit it out. There weren't gonna, there wasn't gonna be some kind of artist development in the '90s when, you know, uh, big corporations are owning owning record companies. So the whole time they're trying to ameliorate risk. That's what a record company is trying to do for their money. So they're gonna they're gonna get in there and you are going to you are going to lap dance them. You are going to um, to show your stuff. And I um, got into music because I didn't want to, I didn't fit into, um, I didn't fit into school and I didn't fit into the social thing. It's like all about being a misfit. I wasn't, uh, I did it because I wanted to do things on my own terms. I wanted to, I wanted to make my world a product of me and not become um, subject to it. I didn't want to be subject. I wanted to be um, um, the maker and shaper of my world. And here I am after all that time and, and all this work now trying to fit into, um, you know, Arista Records keyhole. Mm. to see if they can make money off me. Mm. And I had a hard time with that. Uh, by and and so we would you know you'd go in and you would do it someone would listen to you if you were lucky and or not listen to you and then you'd start up all over again and try, it's all about trying to get that record deal. And um by the time we there was kind of a bidding war for us, I was just like you're, you're going to say a bunch of niceties and you're going to be charming to me. And like, I'm just like, Oh God, you know, I just, I, I don't know. I was just like, I've had it. Like, do you want to give us a record deal or not? That's kind of how right. I think. And so the yeah. song graduate uh, was written in that process. Um, oh yeah. Can I graduate? Can yeah. I get my record deal? Can I have my piece of paper? <laughs> you know, it was kind of like that. And that's really, uh, it was the song graduate is, is, you know, can I hold my head up and look at you and actually be my real self? My real self is like, I'm not really your friend. I don't really know you. And I, and I'm, I'm, I don't actually feel your, I don't actually like your energy. I just want, I just want you to give me the resources so I can do what I want to do. That's the truth of it, but I can't be in the truth of it. I have to be this smarmy little hustler. This is what I've, this is what I've, I, I, I have to be a whore to, to do this and I feel like I'm getting fucked. Can I graduate? Right. That's that was kind of the mindset. So you asked me what it was like, it was like that. Yeah. But it was also like, yay. You know. Right, maybe some sort of validation. Sure. Yeah. And then was semi charm life. Was it was it the band? Was it someone else that said, mm -hmm. Hey, we're gonna this is gonna be the single. We're gonna send it to K Rock and Live 105. And like how did that go down? It did, and that's all anybody wanted to do, including Electra. Um, no matter what anybody said, we were um, people weren't really interested in us um, or me. Um, they heard a catchy tune. In were they listening to the lyrics? <laughs> I don't think so, because I was like, they're not going to play this on the radio. First of all, they won't play this on the radio. It's, it's really, it's a filthy, dirty song. And I don't want this one to go on the radio first because it's, it's certainly part of what we're about, but this is, I don't want to be defined by, um, this like one single. I'd like the song losing a whole year to be the first. Love that song. That, that was what I wanted. Um, and I capitulated and then I wanted to, I wanted to direct the video and I wanted to make it this kind of this, this kind of like rundown world where things have lost their energy and was my whole identity. We love the idea, but we're going to get this guy to make the, the record mm. and then sort of behind my back, they go make a pop video. So we were constantly being shaped and, um, molded into their idea of what would make money in the short term. Wow. Wow. Did you know that at the time? Did I know that? I knew that intuitively. I knew that. Yeah, I did. I think, um, but you want to make it and you want, 
um, you know, you you want the band to be um, to be successful and have sure. have opportunities, but but I wanted to I wanted to I wanted to to put Third Eye Blind out there in a way that I could recognize. So that's your brand, you know. Everyone talks about their brand, um, and we couldn't do that. So we were so we were shaped by um, other people's choices. And I found that very difficult um, and, and something that I've had to, to, had to wrangle with for a long time. Did you have a good time when things started going crazy successful for you? Was it fun? It's way more fun now. It is? Yeah. Why? I'm, well, I think I, well, first of all, the band's bigger um, than it was before. So, I mean, this year is kind of a small year but um just just on like forget radio and um you know we still have four five songs that are in rotation on alternative radio right now so they've that are right next to brand new released songs <laughs> they're so so yeah well dust storms now being played on um uh 91X in, in San Diego added it, which I just, I don't know why I love that, but I, I, like that's one of those stations that I kind of love. And, oh, yeah. And um, that's the funeral singers on the album, but that's a different, we can get into that in a minute. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, anyway, those songs are still played on, but besides that, just on just on Spotify, there's a, there was 190 million listens God damn. last year. And then we'll have, we'll go out and we'll play. And, um, we'll play in bigger audiences next summer. So, so, and, um, I'm going to go down the street from your house down to the studio that I'm at, um, in Hollywood today. And I'm going to play with the band and it's going to be hilarious. And we're going to have, um, this, like, we're going to try ideas and, um, um, what do you mean and you're going to go see the band and try ideas? This is rehearsal for the. I'm sh- going to rehearse. Oh, going really? You're going, really, you're going also, to rehearsal after this? Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, nice. We're, but we're we're making a new album right now. We're just we're 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 just continuing to work and and. Wait so, a minute! I'm just starting to get uh, absorb all these new songs. Yeah, but I was just like it's it's like let's have at it, right? Like 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 let's let's be alive in this moment and let's uh, let's make music now and let's just keep let's keep rolling forward if it moves us to do so and it does so my point is is that is that these are the these are the golden days right now Mm. yeah that's honestly how i feel about it good that's cool Um, man and um i think um i think that's also a very healthy mindset for um musicians is, is i i just i don't see value in nostalgia um um I think it's very important to be, to have a goal in the moment that you're in and cultivate your own vibrancy in this moment by being, um, you know, taking care of the machine, being healthy, um, but also being um, engaged um, with, with what's going on right now. Sometimes I see people, you know, and they're just like, you know, Dave Matthews, they're done. That's it. That's whatever that Dave Matthews record is. So I'm just, we're at whatever album, right? And that's they're set in that moment, right? And um, I think um, I think you gotta keep moving forward and keep keep expanding and being being open. Nostalgic was very important during the pandemic. I think I, I wanted something safe, something familiar all the time around me. So I rewatched shows I've seen three times. I listened to bands and songs that I had listened to. A, a million times over and over again. But as we get out of the pandemic and I mean, I don't know if we are or not, but like hearing a band, hearing yourself in a, such a successful band say, no, we're not going to live off these, uh, eight, uh, whatever, all these songs from all these albums. We're going to keep going. We're not, we're not settled based on the previous success. We're still growing. No, I'm not done at all. Good. Mm-mm. Good man. No, not yet. Do you remember when Billy Idol jumped on stage with you at a weenie roast? And saying graduate, 
Can yeah. I graduate? Yeah, so I got in the studio, so I produced him. Oh, for, that ended up coming to fruition then? Well, I think it was before. Uh, but I do remember that, yeah. Yeah. That had to be cool. You're like, as you've been, you're in this band, and then you got Billy Idol close to the peak of his power with all the songs. Who knows the songs that you guys created? Yeah, I like. Yeah, I like. I liked, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Billy Idol. Mm -hmm. As you look back on uh, your career and your life, is anything you would change? You would keep it the same? I don't know. I, I, I don't usually engage in those kinds of questions. I think that, um, I think it's important to have, I think what's important um, for me as an artist and for, for people in general is, is wake up in the morning and, and um, refine your purpose and um, that purpose has to have, it has to be honorable and, and then you got to have the energy to, to go after that purpose and, um, and then you've got to take the steps, just go make those steps to get what of those little starts for me, it starts with making the bed, got to make your bed and None of that is about what you'd change because what you'd like, you know, go back and do differently. That all just sounds kind of like self recrimination and, and those things are going to slip into you, into your, you're going to have that no matter what you're going to think back on things that you, ah, oh, you wish you'd said or done or, you know, people you wish that you were more loving to or any of those, those kinds of things. Um, it's going to happen. Um, and I think that what's, if there's some amends that you need to make sure, you know, if, if there's like, if there's a, something you need to re really reach back to, if there's somebody, uh, including your childhood self, for example, that was talking about, about like, you know, healing my liver. Um, okay, that's good. But other than that, it's really about the goal of what are we going to do now? This being the case, what what is the best course of action forward because it's all forward so i'm just really curious um i meant it when i said um thank you for listening to my album and thank you for uh liking it yeah i um i have i usually don't listen to my music at all uh and i know a lot of artists who do that um, but I've listened to um, our band apart a few times in the car, and it's one of the few times where listening to my own music, I don't feel um, like I want to pick it apart. Like, ah, oh, the hi hat's too bright, or you know, um, I shouldn't have doubled those guitars. <laughs> some some things which I usually which I usually do. Um, so so I feel really good about this album. And I'm just curious, like, were there songs on it that you like, like funeral singers, funeral singers, funeral singers. Oh my God. I love it. And I also love the very first song on the record. It just sounds like a very authentic, real record. And it sounds like you, uh, goodbye to the days of ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Uh, yeah. I also like dust storm too. Dust Storm, I told you, was the last song recorded on the album, and uh, it's that's kind of my favorite song on the album um, because it, I think it is really how, to me, that's like what the pandemic and the lockdown was in terms of of um, the the relationships um, and the and the pressure and the friction um, that it put on um, relationships, but also like the opportunities that we had to really, really value each other and really care about each other. So like, um, he, there's a moment and you probably had, did you have this moment where you're like, we're, 
we need to like, we need to band together right now because we're what we've got and we need to rely on each other and we need to be partners right now in this. Oh yeah, absolutely. It is terrifying to go to a grocery store. Yes. Did you have that sense? Uh, oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So like how we hold each other, how we care about each other right now is now has this real, real value um, uh, that we, I'm sure it always has, but that we perhaps have taken for granted before. It's now held into relief. Um, and I got as close to to evoking that as, as I could on that album. So, yeah. So that, that album, will, that song is going to get played live. Yeah. Good, good. Well, listen, man, I'm super grateful that you came over and you shared so much. And I got to learn so much about you, how you tick and the music and the new album. I even again. took my glasses off eventually. I know. Yeah. You know we got two coffees yeah. for you. The guy is totally wired. Now you're going to go to rehearsal. I've ruined your vocal cords for the day because we've talked so much. How the hell yeah. are you going to go sing? going to just go sing like a, just, just <laughs> going to do it. Um, yeah. Abs- I invite everybody to get absolutely jacked on coffee. It's my favorite drug. But only, but sleep hygiene is very important. So, you know, cut off. What does sleep hygiene mean? About just getting eight hours or so? The half-life of coffee, a half-life of, uh, of caffeine uh, is like 11 hours. So, um, so. You know, by midnight tonight. Um, what time do you go to bed? I try to go to bed really early. Uh, I like to go to bed by like 11. Um, and I usually don't get to sleep till midnight. Because um, either way, I wake up at 7. So, yeah, I like to. And I, I try to just do everything I can to get, like, to maximize sleep. Okay. Um, and... So you can, ju- I think that, co- I think coffee is really good for you. Um, I think it's a great drug and um, probably shouldn't have, have it after, after 12 noon. Okay. That's All my right. Well, it's past 12 noon now and you're yeah. having it. So you're going to be up, you're going to rehearse, yeah. you're going to be wired, you're going to do good. I'm a um, rebel. Our band apart, that is the new album, Third Eye Blind, Stephen Jenkins. We will see you on the road. The tour is going to be big. And thanks so much for coming over, man. It's great yeah. to be here in the presence of the mighty eagle. Can't believe you came into my house. Two That's the, I just kicked his foot by accident. That's Stephen Jenkins. I am Ted Stryker. Thanks for watching, everybody. Happy snuggle. See you later. Hope you enjoyed. Now hit that subscribe button. And for more Tuna on Toast, listen wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>